All right, it's uh, 12 noon here on the East Coast. Good morning all, or afternoon, or evening, depending upon your time zone. Thank you for attending our webinar this morning, Defending Smaller Enterprises from Mob Action with Distributed Security Networks. I am Les Leslie, Vice President of Business Development for Distributed Security Incorporated. Distributed Security is a private security company. We train individuals and teams to actively defend life and property from violent threat. We are the creators of distributed security networks, enabling enterprises to develop distributed security bases and operate proprietary security forces capable of defending immediate community assets. We offer a number of turnkey packages and services to include infrastructure, training, provisioning, and outsourcing. Presenters today are Mike Smock, co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Distributed Security, Bill Tallon, Executive Vice President of Training, Brand Danielowski, co-founder, Executive Vice President and Chief Instructor, and myself, other panelists on the call are Dr. Chuck DeBoer, Vice President, Tactical Medicine, and Randy Bartlett, Vice President, Strategic Engagements. Agenda today will be a situation report uh, from Bill, uh, a block of uh, information regarding establishing distributed security networks from Mike, uh, some training information how we do things, why, and uh, where we draw that information from by Bill and Ron. And the last piece will be mine uh, in terms of helping everyone understand what next steps might be for your organization. With all that being said, I'll turn the controls over to Bill. As soon as I find the button to do so. You're up, Bill. Bill? Do you see my screen left? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. All right, let's start by dispelling some common myths and misconceptions regarding uh, security for private enterprise. Myth number one is that the cops will protect you, but the truth is they have no legal obligation to defend you uh, based upon Supreme Court uh, decisions and established law, nor do they have the capacity to be on scene to defend you um, from kinetic threats, especially now in the context of the ongoing civil disorders. If they do come, they will not be there in time. Uh, police response across America uh, average is about five to ten minutes from the placing of, of an emergency call. Uh, we know uh, historically that active shooter events are usually over in far less than five to ten minutes and the worst of mob violence, arson, breaking and entering, looting, property destruction, personal injury, the worst of that is also over usually rather swiftly. Myth number two is that you can protect yourself with security guards, uh, especially retired law enforcement officers. But the sad truth is that your retired cop cannot stop a violent mob. And the highest level of training and proficiency he ever achieved when he was on active duty as an officer decays steadily after his retirement. His uniform presence is gonna give you a visual deterrent and the response to, to less serious threats uh, that may arise, but that's about all. Myth number three is that technology will protect you, but the truth of this is that technology can provide deterrence and detection and delay to varying degrees, but no real protection against an actual attack because by definition, the moment a violent attack of any sort begins, these systems have failed. 
Myth number four, a gun-free zone will protect you. Well, we know, tragically, uh, it is true that all a gun-free zone does is assure potential attackers that no law-abiding person on the premises will be able to uh, resist them. A gun-free zone may as well be called an unarmed victim zone. Myth number five is that civilians cannot be trained to confront violence. But the truth here is that every SWAT officer, every military special operator uh, begins as an untrained civilian. Law enforcement comprises a very, very broad skill set. The typical law enforcement academy for a law enforcement recruit runs 700 to 800 hours, but only 40 to 60 hours of that involves firearms and combative skills and use of force. The enterprise doesn't need police officers. It only needs people capable of protecting innocent life and property uh, on the scene and in the moment uh, that violence presents itself. Civilians are very easily trained in that narrow skill set. DSI has been doing it literally for years. So uh, what kinetic threats do enter enterprises face now in, in 2020? What is the new normal? The past is not always prologue. American enterprises have enjoyed 200 years of relative safety and security thanks to a classically liberal social order, a free market economy, individual freedoms guaranteed by our Constitution, and a rule of law that has been sometimes challenged, but generally resilient and stable. These conditions have been changing okay, over the last few decades, and the rate of change has accelerated very, very rapidly in recent months and weeks and days. We have to confront our normalcy bias. This is a cognitive bias that leads people to disbelieve or minimize threat warnings. If a thing has never happened before in our experience, we tend to ignore indications that it might. The old normal that we are conditioned to is being rapidly overtaken by events due to economic fragility, increased lawlessness, a decline in the ability of law enforcement to protect us, and a whole stew of divisive, polarizing political and race-based movements. Kinetic or violent dynamic threats have traditionally been considered low probability and high consequence events. In other words, they are unlikely or infrequently occurring, but they're very serious when they do happen. We devoted more attention to pilfering than we did to Molotov cocktails coming through the front window, and rightfully so, because uh, theft was a constant and ongoing threat with real damages, uh, and the threat of, of violence was, was much, uh, much less, probability much less, and the frequency much less. But now, under today's conditions, the probability of these kinetic threats is approaching 1.0, which is to say, it's near certain. And the consequence of these events is near the top of the scale. And this is true in locations across America. So what we're speaking of here is actual, no longer hypothetical threats. The question now for individuals and enterprises is when will these threats appear on their doorstep? back this up. Here we go. The new normal. There's two major recent developments okay, that are testing how we can respond to widespread and simultaneous challenges. Okay, First is COVID-19, and second is this wave over the last two to three weeks now of nationwide civil disorder. COVID-19 is not a black swan event. That's how we describe events that are of large scale and major effect that were unpredictable. But swine flu, bird flu, SARS, MERS, Ebola gave us plenty of warning of the threat of, of pandemic disease, but we were unprepared. The first order effects of COVID-19, the infections and fatalities, yes, they're significant, but they've been very uneven from one locale or region to another, extremely serious in places like New York City and the surrounding region, very minimal in much of rural America. The second order effects of COVID-19, that's an entirely different issue. 
These include unemployment, scarcity of goods and services, both real and imagined, economic decline with a massive and quick spike in the national debt, the falling uh, gross domestic product, the erosion of public trust in government based on perceptions of the government's effectiveness in handling the crisis, and the individual mental and emotional, emotional stresses that arise from, uh, from our social distancing and other uh, responses to the pandemic. All of this contributes to social instability when we are already, as a nation, as a society, much less cohesive and resilient than we once were. And then came the George Floyd incident, triggering a wave of violent civil disturbances on a scale that we have not seen in America since 1967 and 1968. As of June 9th, Minneapolis reported nearly 1,000 commercial properties vandalized, rooted, or reduced to rubble, 67 or more destroyed completely by fire. The estimates of experts on the scene, insurance experts and, and uh, enterprise owners, is that costs are now exceeding half a billion dollars in Minneapolis, which makes it the second costliest civil disturbance in U.S. history behind only uh, the Los Angeles riots in 1992. That is the impact on one city. Protests, many of them violent, have occurred so far in 140 cities across the nation. In fact, I, I don't have a current tally today. That was two or three days ago. The damages, the human toll and deaths and injuries are mounting, and there is simply no tally of the total. But if you can extrapolate from Minneapolis, you wouldn't be too far off. Widespread violence erupts in these in these cities, in these locales, uh, often from otherwise lawful and peaceful protests because it only takes one triggering action, one person acting out, one brick in the air, one shot. The violence and destruction is sometimes targeted on specific government or commercial targets, uh, but it's often entirely random. And law enforcement capacity, as one would expect, has been overwhelmed in many of these locales, even with National Guard support. Uh, given the scale of the disturbances. So what does this mean to businesses in affected zones? Workforce is a risk of violence while on the job or commuting. Your physical plant can be damaged or entirely destroyed. Your supply chains and transportation are at risk. Your inventory can make your business a very attractive target for looting. And insurance coverage will be increasingly problematic the longer this goes on and the higher claims mount. So we have a new kinetic threat matrix. We have all of the old normal threats that we've been looking at and considering for years. Disgruntled current or former employees, local criminal elements, street gangs and organized crime, uh, active shooters who can arise from any of those above categories and from other categories as well. Uh, and now we add the new normal. The new normal includes mob action, organized or not, motivated by political and social grievances or wilding or and encompassing looting, arson, physical destruction by multiple players uh, and significant violence against persons. So what do we have? We have a situation where protecting the life, safety and property of your enterprise under these conditions requires on-scene capabilities because law enforcement cannot do it for you. There's a critical response gap between a call for help and effective police intervention, and that gap is expanding towards infinity. Only you can fill it. A comprehensive security plan based upon trained armed associates operating within the law and in close cooperation with law enforcement is all that may stand between your business and violent threats that give you little or no prior notice. The good news is that enterprise most definitely can protect themselves, deterring kinetic threats by being ready to meet and defeat them. An iconic example of that is illustrated here uh, from 1992 in Los Angeles, when uh, residents and business owners in the Koreatown sector of Los Angeles armed themselves and stationed themselves to uh, to hold off mob violence uh, over.
over a period of time when law enforcement response was absolutely unavailable to them. So at that point, I would like to hand off the presentation to Mr. Smock. So, Mike. Got him, Jack. You got me, Bill? I got you. Loud and clear. Very good. Thank you, Bill. Going to um, talk about distributed security networks and more specifically get into uh, those things that are required in order to actually establish a, a distributed security network. Let me uh, start by defining a distributed security network. Um, and not to get tedious, but I, I just want to read the definition that, that we use here at, at Distributed. Distributed security networks are various <clears throat> combinations of businesses, schools, churches, and communities who collaborate to defend against violent threats. A network can range from an informal association of local residents and business owners, business owners banding together to defend common territory, to a private security force and training facilities organized, staffed, and administered by community members. When we talk about a private security force in this context, we're not talking about a private security firm that you hire. We are talking about that being an in-house um, function as indicated that is staffed by employees and local community residents. The key phrase in all this, uh, folks, is violent threat. Uh, this is not a community watch program. And to do this, we will be mounting an active defense. Let's um, take a look at, at, at the concept of active defense and, and once again go into uh, definition mode. Active defense is the ability to stop a violent threat minimizing casualties and damage and securing the scene prior to the arrival of law enforcement. Active defense utilizes network employees and or residents who are highly trained, coordinated, and thoroughly vetted to form an armed security cadre. In other words, they are not hillbillies with guns showing up on your doorsteps. Ron and Bill here in a second will take you through the training that we utilize in order to develop uh, that armed security cadre. So why, uh, for the enterprises on the call, why, why do you want to establish, why would you want to establish a distributed security network? Well, uh, to begin with, the obvious answer is to defend life and, and property. And as Bill just went through, number two, so eloquently, you know, the actual threat. We're in uh, totally uncharted waters. We have no idea of what's coming next. Um, and there is a need uh, for individual enterprises and individuals to adopt a posture of, of self-defense. Uh, especially when it comes to uh, business enterprises who currently count on law enforcement between the defunding uh, initiatives that are currently underway, uh, between the dwindling budgets that were already being cut dramatically before all this kicked off, uh, between the low morale uh, right now on existing law enforcement forces and, and then compound that with the recruiting problems they're going to have in bringing on uh, good law enforcement officers. Um, there is a genuine need at this point to take a look at establishing your own distributed security network. Um, next reason too is, is the cost. Uh, the cost of establishing a distributed security network is significantly less than if you were to attempt to provide the same coverage by paying um, an outside private security firm. Another reason is simply the effectiveness, uh, the training that we, um, at least that we put into place uh, that are part of our programs, 
uh, train individuals to a much higher standard than you will find in any private security firm. Uh, and most importantly, um, uh, anybody who is currently planning on utilizing a security force consisting of uh, CCW holders and uh, folks who have you know, purchased a gun for the first time or went through training 13 or 14 years ago, uh, that's not a high standard of training. And the effectiveness uh, of that sort of, of, of a response will be well questionable uh, to say the least, but more importantly, potentially lethal uh, if, if not employed uh, properly. So. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about training from us today and, and the importance of training in order to, to make this work uh, properly. The next reason to uh, establish a distributed security uh, network is trust. Um, from the standpoint of an immediate community, you will be dealing uh, with people that you know. You will know who the uh, which enterprises are potentially a strong link. You will know those that probably are not. You will have day-to-day -day familiarity, more than likely, with potential participants in that network. Adding to that, number seven, loyalty. Uh, within a specific um, immediate community, there is loyalty to that turf. Uh, your neighbors, your neighboring enterprises, uh, residents, if there's any re residential component to the uh, area, will all have a vested interest in, in defending that turf. And last, uh, but most importantly, with the new normal, what it basically is coming down to, folks, is the fact that if you can't defend it, uh, you're not going to own it. Uh, that's pretty much the new reality, uh, 2020, post-COVID post George um, and as Bill uh, started to indicate those of you who are getting advice from attorneys to let your insurance cover your losses uh, those of you who might be getting advice from attorneys who are saying that if you do something like this you're taking on significant liability um, I would, you know, sit down and start to question those uh, assertions, especially when it comes to, ins to the insurance side of the equation. As Bill indicated, and as I'll uh, amplify, the ability of insurance to cover these costs in the near term through the balance of this year and into next year is likely going to be significantly hampered not only by the current uh, crisis and, and the losses that are currently being generated, but we haven't even begun to take a look at what they may or may not be responsible for coming out of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. So uh, insurance, uh, we don't think insurance will be a reliable uh, fallback for enterprises. Even in the past when insurance was reliable, the unfortunate aspect of that was the fact that uh, once you filed a claim, uh, we all know what happens to our, our premium. So uh, at best, I think insurance has provided uh, somewhat of, of, of security theater and the assumption that you can cover your losses. That's no longer the case. Um, and from the standpoint of those owning private enterprises who have their livelihood, um, their life uh, savings, their homes wrapped up in their enterprises, you're at a point where essentially it's on you uh, to defend um, that, that not only that enterprise, but um, uh, your livelihood. Let's talk now about uh, uh, getting a little more specific into the components of a distributed security network. There are uh, four components that actually make up a distributed security network. The first is territory, um, and territory is essentially a definition, uh, a geographic definition of what it is that is to be defended. And that territory at some point will be uh, further defined by a perimeter, and that perimeter uh, will be generated based upon the enterprises that are participating uh, in the distributed security network. The next component is organization. Uh, this is both from a functional standpoint and a, an entity standpoint. 
any distributed security network will need a coordinating entity uh, that could be casual or informal. It could be very formal, depending upon the type of, of network that you uh, employ. We'll talk about the types of networks here in a second. But within that organization, they would be responsible for the roles, uh, responsibilities of, of uh, participants within the distributed security network, the training program uh, that would be utilized, and most importantly, the response. When an event kicks off, um, what is the response plan? The next piece would be infrastructure. Uh, any distributed security network is based around a robust training capability. Uh, typically, that training would take place at a third party um, facility, uh, such as a, a training range. Um, but with the types of programs that we offer, this could also be an embedded uh, piece of infrastructure that would be part of the distributed security network. Uh, we call it a, distri a distributed security base, and we'll talk a little more about that in a second. Last but not least, uh, the final component here is, is a partnership. That partnership is with local law enforcement. Uh, you absolutely have to have an, an alliance with your local, state, and even the federal uh, agencies. And what we mean by that is, at bare minimum, their uh, approval of what you're doing, uh, but more importantly, um, potentially the integration of, of their efforts with yours, including joint training um, exercises uh, with the, the actual uh, law enforcement officers that might be responsible for uh, your specific community. So four components uh, to a, a distributed security network, a territory, organization, infrastructure, and then uh, partnership. Let me next talk about the uh, uh, different types of dis uh, distributed security networks. Um, there are three basic types. The, the first would be what we call an, an informal uh, network. This would be involved minimal training uh, with the participants, uh, but they would work off of a shared plan and have a shared objective. This is uh, best for sole proprietors who are running small retail operations with limited resources. Uh, it is absolutely critical that they recruit others into the network uh, for effectiveness. An example, an, an example of an informal network would be a, a small town uh, with a main street, uh, might be a small uh, village with a main uh, corridor where most of the uh, village uh, uh, establishments are. Um, it could go on for potentially several blocks, but uh, in that case, an informal network minimal training might be enough to, to meet their needs. The next uh, type would be an actual security force. Uh, this would involve organized training, uh, coordinated objectives, uh, including strategy, uh, tactics, and resources. Uh, this would be best for smaller enterprises occupying common territory with a shared desire and commitment to fund security uh, efforts. An example of this sort of a, of a network could be an urban retail block, uh, literally a single block, maybe even a street, uh, high density, um, mixed use, but enough uh, horsepower within that um, immediate community to provide for both the funding and the manpower necessary to put together uh, a dedicated security force. And when I say dedicated, uh, in our words here, we're not talking about uh, uh, a dedicated uh, 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 proprietary force. We're talking about employees and residents within that community um, being part of that, that standing uh, dedicated force. Last would be a security base. Uh, this would involve what we would call optimal training. Uh, there would be coordinated infrastructure, objective strategy, tactics, and resources. This sort of an approach is best for a single larger enterprise who would underwrite the development and operation of a distributed security base. An example of this uh, could be a business or, the, or industrial park. It could be in suburbia. It could be uh, within a major urban center. 
the territory would be defined by the park um, uh, boundaries and the individual enterprise that would underwrite the development and, and operation of the base itself uh, could also potentially turn it into a profit center. Uh, we have programs and resources that uh, allow an enterprise to, uh, to actually implement this. Uh, we provide a full turnkey package consisting of the infrastructure, the provisioning, which would be the weapons and gear, ammo, uh, along with a very robust training and practice uh, program, and then uh, the business plan, uh, how a, uh, a larger enterprise might actually turn this into a profit center. So three different um, looks at potential distributed uh, security networks. Uh, starting with a very informal, low-cost uh, network uh, coming up into a dedicated security force and then ending with an actual security base uh, that would be hosted by a, a single enterprise. And then finally, I want to uh, go through um, the general steps that you might follow in order to establish a distributed security network. The most important thing, um, number one, is to actually become what we call a defended enterprise. Because a distributed security network depends upon mounting an active defense, it's absolutely uh, critical that you or your employees are trained to a basic level of competency uh, to deliver on that, uh, that promise. A CCW license doesn't qualify you for that. Having been in the military 20 years ago and going to the range once a month doesn't qualify you to do that. You need to have proper defending and or proper training in order to be able to approach the notion of becoming a, a defended enterprise. We um, have um, uh, training programs available, uh, training solutions that begin as low as $289 a month for up to six members. Uh, of a single enterprise. So once you've decided to become a defended enterprise, the next step is to decide on your network type. Will it be informal? Will you, will you do you want your own uh, dedicated security force? Uh, do you want to develop and operate your own distributed security base? So the next step would be to define uh, your network type, followed by uh, defining your territory. Uh, what are you defending? Is it a block? Is it a street? Uh, is it a development? Um, you know, you don't want to uh, overextend your, your reach on this. And at the end of the day, uh, the actual uh, territory will begin to be defined by the participants within the uh, distributed security network. And those participants are ones that, you know, will share your loyalty to the turf. Uh, they will typically share your values when it comes to defense. Um, and they will begin to actually define the overall territory, which uh, is finalized by looking at it from the standpoint of a perimeter. Uh, the perimeter is defined by the participants in the distributed security network and not the territory that you intend to defend. So uh, unless you actually have somebody standing guard and part of that network, then that territory is not being defended. So your network will be um, defined by the participants that are in it. You can grow it over time, uh, but one of the more important aspects of a defended uh, or, a, or a distributed security network is defining that perimeter and then understanding how to defend it. Next up would be defining uh, the level of kinetic response that you want to uh, utilize. This will be driven by the type of network that you establish and the type of training uh, that you decide to take on. Number seven, uh, establishing communications. Uh, we go to great lengths in, in describing uh, various communication uh, formats that, that you can utilize. What type of comms will you want to use to communicate with other network partners uh, during an actual event? Picking up on that will be tactical medical response. Um, in the case of an event, what type of medical support will you have? 
Uh, will you have trained medics? Will you put uh, residents through tactical medical training? Will you have kits available uh, throughout the community in order to respond to, uh, to any wounds? All of these are, are critical inputs into establishing your network. Next, uh, establish what we call the intent to defend protocols. Intent to defend protocols is a document that you develop in partnership with local law enforcement um, in order to identify what you're going to be doing and what they're going to be doing. Uh, most importantly, it identifies what happens when local law enforcement arrives uh, into your perimeter, approaches your perimeter, uh, the identity, how you identify friend or foe, all that is, is uh, put into this intent to defend protocol. As I indicated initially, it is very important that you get uh, the proper uh, cooperation from local law enforcement. Um, and if you find yourself at odds uh, with local law enforcement, which I know some of you are at this point, uh, then you're going to have a decision to make. Um, but I will uh, emphasize that all of our programs are implemented only with the approval of local law enforcement. Um, but uh, for those of you who are currently in some of these hot spots like uh, Seattle and, and Minneapolis, uh, you folks are going to have some hard decisions to make. Last but most importantly, train. Um, in establishing a distributed security network, whether you are establishing an informal network or going all the way up to a security base, training drives everything, uh, proper training. The last thing you want is disorganized and untrained hillbillies with guns, even Koreans on rooftops. You know, God bless what they were doing, uh, but at the same time, were they working? Uh, did they have rules of engagement? Did they know when to engage, when not to engage? Did they know how to engage? Uh, simply brandishing a rifle is not defense. Uh, so far, uh, some people have been able to get away with that. Some people have not, as we have seen in, in, in recent reports. But the most important aspect of establishing any um, effort here to put together a distributed security network begins with, with your commitment to, uh, to trade. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to uh, Bill, uh, Ron Danielewski, who is uh, Executive Vice President and uh, Chief Instructor, will be joining Bill. And what they're going to do is walk you through some of the training resources that you could use in order to um, in order to begin establishing a distributed security network. Bill, I'm going to hand the presentation off to you um, so that you can go ahead and take control and you and, and Ron can bounce back and forth. Uh, you should be hot, Bill. You ready to? I believe I am. You see my screen? Got you loud and clear. All right, folks. Uh, yeah, we're going to uh, take you on a, a quick tour here uh, of our training resources, uh, programs, and plans. Uh, and I'm going to start. by emphasizing a point that I think Mike just made very, very well, and that is that training is the foundation of distributed security and active defense. What we offer to small, medium, and all-sized enterprises includes online courses, resources, and training plans. This is a fairly unique set of offerings uh, uh, in the industry of which we are a part. We offer a very, very wide range of resources uh, online for, for self-paced instruction and uh, pre-course preparation and post-course follow-up uh, and, and ongoing training plans to assist in, uh, uh, in on-site training and practice uh, going forward. Uh, Ron will give you a, a, a quick tour through those exact resources on our website here shortly. Uh, we also offer uh, several on-range firearms tactics courses, basic firearms, uh, individual tactics, and team tactics uh, to finally, uh, as sort of the capstone of that private security cadre training. Uh, we have uh, the ability to provide uh, on-site customized training engagements where we take uh, our available resources and, uh, and programs and tailor them directly to your circumstances and your needs. We can offer uh, complete turnkey infrastructure training 
plus provisioning and outsourcing packages um, to, to meet your requirements. We also uh, offer a program to train enterprise leaders because uh, training security operators as individuals and even training them to function effectively as small teams uh, is only part of effective active defense. It's only part of a comprehensive security plan. Uh, we offer what we call the Command School, which is a three-day seminar format course that is designed primarily for CEOs and senior security managers, uh, but is also open at your discretion to your security cadre members. Uh, this three-day seminar addresses primarily how you would develop and integrate uh, an active defense component into your security plan and how you would recruit, screen, train, and operate private security force composed of your own employees. In order to accomplish all of this, uh, we base all of our training upon an extensive existing body of intellectual property. Uh, training programs, courses, manuals, drills, videos, and supporting materials. These are all fully developed and ready for use. And let me just uh, scan quickly through the matrix that we use to, uh, uh, to monitor and, and uh, uh, maintain and develop this intellectual property. Uh, as you can see uh, here, we have a, a list of content uh, in our in our IP library, uh, and all of it uh, characterized by what format it is available in, what plans it is offered in, and how it is integrated into individual courses uh, and the and the uh, roll-up uh, offerings uh, that we present to enterprises. And it goes from, as you see here on this uh, first page, uh, uh, simply introductory material to people who. Uh, who are unfamiliar with firearms and are, and are considering owning one and training with it. And I, let me just flip quickly down through this document so you can see the scope of the materials that we have available. Oh, took me to the bottom, let's run it back up to the top. Okay, uh, firearms fundamental courses uh, incorporate all of these individual components available online, integrated into on-range training programs, available for review online. Tactics for individuals and, and uh, two people working together. Uh, these are tactics programs equivalent to the training provided to uh, law enforcement SWAT teams and special operations. We move into team tactics where we integrate those skills into the operations of a three, four, five, six person team. And then we have our command school, the seminar format program for enterprise leadership. And then we have our specialized programs in tactical medicine and tactical communications. Uh, all of that is on the shelf in our pockets and ready to present upon demand. So at that point, I would like to pass this to uh, Ron. Ron, the presentation is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Beautiful. Uh, as Les mentioned, my name is Ron Danielowski. I am a EVP and the chief instructor at DSI. And, uh, you know, Bill kind of gave you the uh, 100,000 foot overview of the curricula. There's obviously a lot there. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back around here. I'm going to give you maybe a 50,000 foot tour of our training plan and the Defense Academy. Um, there is a lot of information in here uh, that I'm obviously not going to be able to share with you uh, due to time limits. Uh, if you're considering our program uh, for your enterprise, I'd be happy to give you a more in-depth tour uh, with Q&A at a later date. Um, you can get a hold directly uh, into DSI, patch into DSI. Mike will give you all that contact information. You can contact me and we'll schedule a more private in-depth tour uh, at a later time. Okay, so I'm going to start here at our homepage. 
Uh, you log in here, you see me, I'm logged in, uh, it gives me the log out option. Uh, you, normally what you'd see is an uh, option to use your username and password to get in. Uh, once you're in, you'll find yourself at our headquarters page. And you can see the programs Bill's talking about, the basic advanced team. We also have instructors and students uh, as well. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you our basic plan. I'm going to click here. And it's going to take us over to the basic plan for individuals. And this might be a little bit hard for you to see on your computer screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to really quick flip over here to my copy. I can kind of blow this up a little bit for you and uh, make it a little bit easier to see. Uh, as the title suggests, this is the student copy of our individual and team training plans. If you kind of look down here at the bottom, you can see we have not just that, but we've also got the Tier 3, the Tier 2, and the Tier 1, which is the individual, the team tactics, and the enterprise offerings we have. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it, it, I'd like to start by saying that, you know, no matter where you go for training, um, if you're taking a, uh, you know, 4-hour, 8-hour, 16-hour, a 32 hour course, um, it, what gives an individual the skills is uh, not the course that they're taking. <clears throat> what gives the students the skills, the adult learner the skills is actually practicing this stuff uh, at home, uh, practicing this stuff on a regular basis. And so what we've done is we've come up with these uh, training plans and what they allow a student to do, again, whether they've been with us for four hours or uh, 32 hours or whatever extent, it gives the students an ability to come back in uh, to the training uh, plan and then start working their way through uh, what they've already learned. Uh, and what this also allows us to do is prep the students uh, for uh, intellectual um, discussions they can have uh, by looking uh, at this material ahead of time before they take the course. Uh, so they're more prepared when they get to the range with their instructors. Uh, we do not spend uh, classroom time uh, with instructors on the range. Uh, that range time is very precious. So we spend uh, almost all of our range time with practical hands-on uh, application uh, of the skills. <clears throat> so this is pretty simple, straightforward. Uh, you'll see the task name, and we basically hand walk students through each step. Uh, to supplement this, uh, we do uh, dry practice on a regular basis online, live with students, so we can uh, answer their questions about those training plans uh, three days a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, morning time. We can schedule different times as needed, uh, but we can answer students' questions uh, live, in person, um, all the time. So. Uh, these are pretty well thought out. These are pretty well put together. Um, if you look at these, you'll see that uh, over here in the notes column, a uh, student can hover over these notes and they'll be able to see exactly what that task is in great detail. Uh, as the students work their way through this, for instance, uh, you can come over here and let's say uh, presentation reholstering. There's a description here uh, of what we want them to do. And then there's a link. You can click on that link. That link will take you directly again into the website. And what it does is it gives the students a really quick uh, introductory sentence on what they'll be learning. It gives them a short uh, three to five minute video. And then it gets into a uh, detail of how the particular skill we're wanting them to learn uh, is approached, how it's executed, uh, and gives them a great deal of information of not just how to do it, but why we're doing the things the way we're doing. If you look in the right-hand column, uh, you can see that uh, we made navigation through these pretty easy for the students to include putting our manuals up here on the right-hand side and putting different drills, handgun, rifle, shotgun drills over here on the right side. So for instance, uh, if you look at this, you'll see we're at 06, draw presentation. Uh, you can come down here, 06, draw presentation. You can go to 07 if you want to about contact drills, et cetera. Um, so let me take you through the rest of the website, the headquarters page you saw when we first locked in. Um, if you'll remember when I showed you the uh, headquarters page, uh, you saw that basic membership, that's here as well. Uh, so you can go for the basic, the advanced the team membership. Uh, contents has our videos, for instance, handgun drills. Uh, you'll see where we're at right here, six. Again, you can navigate that way. Same works with shotgun, rifle drills. Our manuals, 
uh, in our library are here as well. Uh, resources, we've got forums. Those work the way all forums work. We have a threat center uh, that can give you uh, detailed information on what's going on in your AO. Uh, we're partnering with uh, various organizations for that. We've got case study resources, instructor information, et cetera. Uh, you can see down here, I mentioned previously the dry practice training. We do that live uh, in the mornings. We also have weekly conference calls uh, for, for instance, a tour like this uh, with not quite the same time restraints as we have now. Uh, we have online courses. <clears throat> uh, you can, DSI offers three types of certifications. We have a certificate of achievement if a student comes through and only does the hand portion, uh, handgun portion, rifle, shotgun portions of the training. Uh, if they come to the online courses, they can also get a certificate of achievement for completing the appropriate tier training uh, for their training by using the uh, online portion. Uh, but they only get the graduate certificate if they come through, they complete both the online and the on-range uh, portion of the training. Uh, these all go in depth. Uh, they begin with the introduction of the material. Uh, they finish with a quiz. Uh, the quiz it automatically generates a certificate that goes to the students. Uh, and they can, we ask them to print those out, keep a hard copy. Uh, and I can explain that in a little bit. Uh, we've got uh, a student portal uh, that gets into the handgun basics because uh, handgun rifle shotgun basics where we do the pre-course training as well as post-course training. Uh, then we've got uh, CFI Defender 300 uh, DSI. They'll take you back to our home page. And I think the only thing I really want to add on top of this is uh, the student portal. Uh, go to the pre-course training. And um, what I'd like to point out to you is the uh, whoop, well, I'll go down here to the uh, going deeper section. Oop. I'll tell you what, there's an easy way to navigate to this. Let's go to the post course training. Uh, we also have a training notebook. I'm going to keep this real brief. Uh, the students need to print out this training notebook. Um, and it does two things. The first thing it does is it helps them achieve their goals uh, in a very rapid uh, order of uh, succession of being able to uh, look at it, what it is they want to do and uh, achieve those goals uh, methodically. Um, we do everything in that from uh, taking the students, showing them how to set up a safe dry practice area in their own home, uh, through how to uh, start working on what is called mental management and it finally concludes uh, down here at the bottom um, with their record of training and courses. And as I mentioned previously, uh, we have them print out those certificates. Uh, these training notebooks uh, are the primary training tool the students will use uh, in their training, their own self-training. Um, and we have them print out those certificates, not just of DSI, but any other defensive training they get anywhere. That goes into the back end of this book that's all of the material in here is archived uh, once a month. And uh, those we ask the students, uh, their certificates, uh, their training log, their training logs, uh, their whole mental management aspect of this uh, to be uh, archived in a safe place, uh, for instance, where they might put their wills, their stocks, their bonds, their certificates uh, in, in a safe space that they can, if, you know, you know, God forbid they actually have to use these skills, uh, then they have the ability to pull this out and we encourage them to get their defense team uh, to submit their training as evidence. And what that allows them then to do if that is accepted as evidence is to uh, be able to open up the entire course curricula uh, to their jury, uh, which then um, allows that jury to understand why that individual uh, made the decisions they made in the scariest few seconds of their lives. Um, again, it was a quick overview of uh, DSI and our program. Um, and again, I'd love to, if you're interested in this, uh, take you on a deeper journey in this uh, at a later date. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over now to Les Leslie. Thank Bless you, Ron. You I do. Thank you very much. All right. So what's the punchline? What um, what can DSI do for you folks in attendance and, and your organizations? 
um, understanding that, you know, we all have some challenges in front of us in terms of securing our, our businesses and our, our networks and our, our uh, neighborhoods. The short answer is developing a distributed security network. Um, as, as has been mentioned, we offer a range of enterprise packages uh, to accommodate your organization's size, security budget, et cetera, um, starting with a monthly subscription price uh, of uh, less than $300 and maxing out at, uh, you know, I mean, it, it can be anywhere from $500,000 up on an infrastructure build out. Um, and so just a quick overview of, of kind of what those those opportunities and those offerings are. Um, understanding that every single organization out there is a little different. Everybody has different staffing. Everybody has different budgets. Everybody has different, different constraints and concerns. Um, you know, we don't pretend that there's a one size fits all. Um, we would like to talk to you probably, probably you know, offline and, and privately uh, for free and assess your enterprise's security needs, your your enterprise, your business, your organization, what have you. Um, and we can form a plan together going forward. Um, another very cost effective and uh, fundamental uh, option is simply the DA team membership, the Defense Academy team membership. Um, that's online only. It's uh, for six of your team members. It's a one-year commitment, and it's $289 monthly. Um, and what you get for that, essentially, is access to all the stuff that Ron just showed you in the DA um, and being able to have access to those drills, the manuals, the videos, um, and all that uh, supporting information. Um, physical team training um, is very important in our, in our minds. Um, because on the range is where you really solidify those those skills that you're going to need to to save life and and protect property. Um, again, each of those packages is for six team members. Um, there is DSI Tier Four, Tier Three, and Tier Two programs. Um, the team training can be somewhat a la carte, uh, depending upon what you you know what you feel that your organization needs and how developed you want your security team to be something to keep in mind here is that you know while you look at at the cost at the bottom being you know somewhere between eight thousand to seventy five thousand dollars for a team of six if you were to employ contract security uh, on your site you're going to pay a single armed contract security guard annually what it will cost you to train six of your own employees to a basic SWAT level competency. Um, and so for all you guys out there who, who are busy, you know, mashing buttons, uh, working on budgets and, and trying to figure out how to make your dollars go further, that's the, that's the thing to keep in mind, okay? You can have six of your employees that already show up and punch the clock every single day who are loyal to your business because they have a vested interest in, in keeping the doors open, trained to a SWAT level competency for the same cost annually that you would pay for one contract security guard who doesn't have any loyalty to your business at all. Um, beyond that, we have the command school uh, offering that uh, Bill mentioned. Um, more of a classroom thing, more designed for security management and C-suite individuals. Um, some lecture, discussion, tabletop exercises, and uh, just learning how to establish and implement an active defense and uh, distributed security base and distributed security network. Um, three days, uh, pretty pretty comfortable environment, um, and the cost commitment there is is under four thousand dollars for the individual for those three days. Um, and lastly, um, the distributed security base. Um, you know, Mike was discussing the fact that a, a distributed security network needs an anchor point, um, and that is the, the, the distributed security base. It becomes your security hub uh, for whatever territory you're you're attempting to to defend, 
and protect. Um, there's an entire business plan surrounding this um, so that you can start to approach security not so much as an expense, but as a revenue generator, as a profit center. Um, it includes your infrastructure build out. It includes your provisioning, um, all those those peripheral uh, ideas that we discussed surrounding that. Um, and essentially, that's you know half a million dollars and up. Um, so yes, if if what you're doing is looking to secure more of of an area, um, if you're looking to kind of be that that central uh, community security source and um, and coordinate and organize with the rest of your community, uh, the DSB might be the way to go for you. Um, in every single one of those cases, if you'd like to talk about any of this, uh, feel free to, to reach out and talk to me. I'm here, you know, almost all the time, um, either by, by cell or my email. Um, those, uh, those contacts are there on the, on the page, uh, on the screen. And with that in mind, um, I'd like to thank you all for being here. Um, and I'd like to open the floor to questions for anybody who's in attendance.